Dust collection systems are pretty brilliant. Instead of buying an entire dust collection unit for every single machine you own, you buy some pipes, put them on the ceiling, and then you can get that sweet, sweet vacuum pressure at all your tools for a fraction of the cost. My system is very much like others, however it has a notable exception. Mine can do this. You saw that right. This system turns itself on when you open the gate. You might be asking yourself, why would someone put all this time and effort into creating this solution when they could just plug their hose in, walk over to the dust collector, turn it on, walk back to their machine, make their cut, walk back to the dust collector, turn it off, walk back to their machine, cap the hose off. Imagine trying to be productive if you followed all of those steps that I fabricated earlier to make my point. This dust collection system is still a work in progress, and I haven't been using it for long, but already it has definitely made my shop a lot cleaner, and has made my experience in the shop a lot more enjoyable. The disc sander and the bandsaw have their permanent hookups mostly built. The radial arm saw is next on the list for some attention. It still has this very primitive hookup that I made many years ago, and as you can see, uh, very high quality integration into the new system. The relay inside this box is what controls the dust collector. The relay's coil is powered by one of these 12 volt transformers. This plug is connected to all the switches inside the gates. Any short across these wires will turn the dust collector on. This switch here lets me change between operating modes. Auto mode means that it's waiting for an input from these signal switches. When I switch it to off, that disconnects all the wiring inside. This is for maintenance. And switching it to on will put 12 volts directly across the coils of the relay. That was pretty cool. I got the camera held up against the pipe connected to the dust collector. My cinematography skills are nuanced and amazing. <laughs> Let's do that again. <laughs> These blast gates are the most important part of the system, so let me show you how I put one together. The main components of the gate are these four printed pieces and this limit switch. The upper part of the gate receives the switch in this cavity and it leaves the plunger of the switch exposed below. In order to retain the switch, I use these two zip ties that come with the Prusa printer. The first one threads in through this hole. You can see it seats flush. And that same zip tie goes over top and threads back through. On the second zip tie, I cut the stem off flush near the head, and I use the head itself to tighten the tail of the other zip tie. That also fits into a cavity. When the unit is assembled, the door sits here, and when you pull it open, it creates a path for the air while simultaneously tripping the switch. It trips the switch by having the plunger run up this incline. When the printer tries to create sloped surfaces, it leaves these little steps behind. These steps are somewhat difficult for the plunger of the switch to drag across, so I file them down. A switch can slide over it much more freely. I've also got this incline at the back of the gate, so if I ever remove the door, I can reload it past the switch easily. The next piece to look at is the liner. This goes between the top and bottom plates. It's got these compliant mechanisms here that engage with the door at the open and close position. So when you pull it open, they clip out of the way, and then lock it closed so the vacuum pressure doesn't close the door for you. The compliant mechanism has one layer of filament missing here and one layer of filament missing here, and that way when it's sandwiched between two plates, it has clearance to move freely. The last piece is the bottom plate. There's not much to write home about here, it's just a mirror of the top plate with fewer features. These two holes here get threaded quarter 20, and then bolts go up through them to slide in these slots, and that keeps the door from getting pulled out too far accidentally. Threads in plastic are basically a joke. We're ready for assembly now. There's one, two, three. There's 13 holes that require fasteners, of which I have one, two, only 10. So we're gonna pick our favorite holes and install them. There's one wrench missing from my index here. Can you guess which one? A little hex nut fits right in this socket, and that restrains it from rotating. Now I make a sandwich, make sure I have it lined up correctly. I usually start with the corners when I put these together. I found my wrench, by the way. I designed these overall lengths 
to just lightly engage with the nylon in that nylock nut when I have this most of the way in. So that's all the fasteners I had. On my to-do list now is to hit up the hardware store and pay way too much for bolts. Now I can put the door in. You'll hear the first click as the switch goes over that back ramp. There's the outward detent and the inward detent. Now I gotta put screws in these holes. I swear I'm not doing this for comedic effect. Maybe my thumb was covering this earlier, but look what other wrench is missing. <sighs> Please forgive me. All right, four millimeters, you are close enough. Shut up, we all do it. Oh, it's stuck, nah, just kidding. So that's my blast gate fully assembled. Well, uh, mostly assembled. Just to illustrate the action the switch is doing for me, I've got my multimeter here and I mean, if you can legally call it a multimeter, in conductivity mode. I'll hold those across these two pins. That wasn't supposed to happen. Did I put a fucking dud in here? Here's another one out of the package. Here's me fumbling. Uh, good thing it's easy to take apart. This new switch works. This footage confirms it. I'm testing at every stage because I've become paranoid. Moment of truth, I have not tried this off camera. Yes. This is the old switch. This is my slingshot. <laughs> I'm going to have to play back the footage to see if that went in. <laughs> this gate is pretty much put together. It's ready for its final home by the drill press. The internal diameter of this ring up here is just a press fit with that four and a half inch PVC pipe. When I was setting up the signal wires for the rest of the system, I left a leg over here, but I didn't have the gate yet, so I left these wires hanging. I put these spade connectors on the ends of the signal wire. The collector is in off mode, so if I touch these together, nothing's going to happen. I have these two short breakout wires with spade connectors on both ends. They connect through to each other inside this column here. At some point, I need to contrive a way to segue to a wiring diagram to show how the control box works, and this is as good as any. I'm absolutely not an electrician, nor do I know how to do this right. I'm also pretty intent not to refresh my memory on how to draw these symbols, so I'm just going to wing it. The first thing I'm going to draw down here is my 12 volt source. Now my 120 volt source, the wall. And that's how I'm representing a relay. I'm drawing a blank on how to represent a three position switch in a funny way, but I might turn it into a cat at the end of the segment. I should explain the type of three position switch that I got. It's got the center position here, nothing is connected. So this is the off position we saw earlier. In this position, the 12 volts is sent directly to the relay and that engages this leg of the 120 volt source and that goes off to the motor. Now the real magic happens when the switch is in this position. There's no direct path for the 12 volts to find the relay, but there is if you make one. These are the signal switches that are all wired in parallel to this leg of the relay. If any one of these are connected, the current has a path to flow, the relay is activated, and the dust collector turns on. What's nice about this too is that I can use the radial arm saw here. The dust collector will spool up and get running. Then I can open the bandsaw's gate the circuit is still made. 
Then I can close the radial arm saw's gate and the dust collector has never stopped running, but now I'm using the bandsaw. My justification for making this system might have sounded silly in the first part of the video, but I swear this does save a lot of time when you're going between machines. Uh, okay, I wasted enough of your time with that. I know there's plenty wrong with it, but this does a better job of explaining what I was trying to explain with that monstrosity over there. I feel like most people would reset that shot until the bolt hit perfectly in the center of one of those targets. <laughs> I might not be great on accuracy, but I am good on consistency. <laughs> All right, that's just bizarre. When I'm shooting a crossbow, you definitely do not want to be standing directly in front of it, an inch and a half to the right, and one inch down from where I'm aiming. No, sir. I want to take this moment to mention that my wife is a very wonderful and supportive person. We were going on a walk one time, and the thought just popped into my head, you know what? I want a crossbow. So I said it out loud, and without skipping a beat, she said, get a crossbow. And the rest is history. I found some of the chips I made when I drilled the hole in this thing. Isn't that cool? The astute among you will notice that this ball is not the same from that last set of balls you saw. I have a few mismatched pool balls that I've bought at garage sales over the years. I save them and I use them for machine handles like this. This is the gear shift off my lathe, like every unoriginal schmuck. That lever you just saw is part of the dust collector. This thing is cobbled together from a couple of pieces. The blower is from a Harbor Freight dust collector. The rest of the dust collector is in the trash. I've got a cyclone separator hooked onto the inlet of the blower. And beneath the separator, I have a 32 gallon garbage can. The lip of the can is sealed within this wooden ring. That lever with the pool ball we saw earlier is what presses the garbage can up into that ring. When I move that lever up, that bend in the pipe goes up and pushes the can into the ring. And that lever locks into place in this detent. The ring was machined with a tapered edge in here, so it fits tightly against the lip of the can. This does two good things for me. I don't have to use any foam that might degrade over time to get my seal. Also, I can put a garbage bag inside the can, and the tight seal around the lip of the can and the ring creates a sealed volume of air between the outside of the bag and the inside of the can, so when the vacuum pressure turns on, the bag won't get sucked up. Then it's easier to empty the can. I can just tie up the bag like normal and pull it out of there. Right now, the waste air is routed directly into the room. In its current state, the air is pretty clean. The separator does a really good job of getting rid of the particulates. I do have plans to frame in a box here and line it with furnace filters, so that'll catch all of it. Bonus 3D printed fitting that goes from the pipe into the inlet. I challenge you to find a fitting that goes from four and a half inch PVC to whatever exact size this is. Just ignore that it's wrapped in duct tape. A large part of the convenience factor of this system are these couplings between hoses. This is common dust collector hose. I have it connected to this piece with a compression ring in here. The mating part over here has a press fit to this pipe and they both fit together with magnets. And each machine has their own custom receiver for the tube. Let me show you how I install the magnets in these. I start with a known reference, and I ensure the polarity of the magnets line up correctly with it. Each hole receives two magnets. Confirm that I put those in right, and use them as a reference for all the others. I do a similar process for the receiver. There's a common belief that 3D printed parts are weak, and while that can be true, Careful selection of print settings, like layer orientation, number of perimeters, and infill can make your parts extremely strong. These parts are about as strong as any comparable injection molded component you might be able to buy on the market. And if you don't believe me, you can go fuck. And if you don't believe me, let me show you with a test. That bounced up and hit my light. <laughs> I knew I made the right choice going with LEDs instead of fluorescent tubes.
Also, yes, I know the lights look like they were hung by an absolute amateur, but those are getting changed very soon. So I smashed that on the ground pretty hard, and uh, at the risk of imperiling other items in my shop, I'm not going to do that too much more. And it's pretty much intact. There's probably going to be a big scratch on it from where it hit the ground. Is that it? Nope. Well, this is a good sign if I can't seem to find where the damage is. All right, you know what? I'll do one better. I wanted to show you a clean section view of the part, but the bandsaw melted the plastic and obscured some of the layer lines. You can still see though that this is all solid. It's about solid down to here. These walls are thick, probably 140 thou. The infill is super dense. These things are tough. If you have a 3D printer and you don't necessarily believe that 3D printed parts can be strong, take a print of your choosing. Set the perimeters to about 6 or more, set the infill to at least 30%, print one out, and then smash it into the concrete. You might be pleasantly surprised at how strong it is. Just don't do it around anything fragile. I've decided to continue with the testing theme using every maintenance guy's favorite tool. I'm just kidding. I should probably explain that that was a joke because you probably aren't laughing right now. This odd looking funnel thing is the hookup for the planer. I have yet to figure out a way to push the magnets into the holes. You can see how that might be something of an issue. This one here is the same part that goes on the disc sander, but this one's going on the radial arm saw. This is the hose end for that. These two are going to make up the other end of the hose. This is an end cap for a fitting I'm going to have in the middle of the ceiling. I'm not going to use it very often, so I don't feel like making a gate for it. I think this guy's going to wind up on the end of a long tube. I'll probably wind up using it for general cleanup or sweeping up the floor. Speaking of sweeping up the floor, let's take this part over to the radial arm saw. I recently made a new dust chute for the saw and did not use the old one at all during the process. This is how much dust that one simple project made. Here's the new dust chute. I would say it's superior to the old one in terms of planning. Uh, probably about the same in terms of execution. I don't remember doing this, but it seems that I've left myself a tab to help pull up the end of the duct tape. Isn't that nice of past me? This is the Rev1 connector that I had on there before. This is almost embarrassing to look at. The rubber band held the lugs together, and they were centered together on these tapers. And to save myself from having to print support material, I had a press fit between the uh, blue and green pieces. And that's mostly held together by the texture of the layer lines. Obviously I will take the Rev2 design any day of the week. Let's just compound my embarrassment here. Let's see how I put this together back in the day. About 10 years ago, I bought a big multi-pack of the worst electrical tape money can buy, and I've been desperately trying to use it up. No. Is that, is that JB Weld in there? Oh my god, what was wrong with me? Oh, what was my problem? Oh! Oh, I don't remember that. It's got a, it's got a cavity in there. Oh, and it looks like I cut the ends to, of the tube to flare it out and put it in there. I tried to epoxy it, and... You can see how well the epoxy holds against the uh, against the PLA. So that's why I wrapped it with nine miles of electrical tape. Cool. So here's how I put together the good connectors. I have my tube end. I have a compression ring, also 3D printed. And I have this dust collector hose. Kind of sounds like the uh, low-budget Blue Man Group. The first step of putting these together is to snip the wire in a couple places. You can see there's one cut. There's another. This makes it easier to pull the wire out. Do this very carefully and slowly, because that wire wants to unfold and bite your hand. I pulled out a couple more bits of wire. I had to snip it in a few places to make it come out. So now we load our tube end over top, put the compression ring inside, and we have to very laboriously turn it. This is gonna get ugly. Ah, starting to miss that electrical tape right about now. So I got that ring in there. Now the ring is in place. 
we slide it into the tube end. We're going to have to press it quite a bit. Now that that ring is seated in there pretty well, I take a knife and I cut off the excess tube material. And that's one end of the tube terminated. Now I have to do the same thing on the other side. It's just my luck that the one I did off camera was way easier to do. But uh, here's a completed tube that's ready to be installed. That looks a lot better than what was there before. Let's see how it works. I don't always clamp my camera arm to the ceiling, but when I do... Uh, oh, this shot better be worth it. Okay, that was pretty cool. I'm glad I set that up. But you know what I regret not setting up? A logical transition to the next shot. I've never used the loft command in CAD to make something useful before. And I'll make sure to let you guys know when I finally do. It's very rare that I use the planer, but when I do, I usually use it for a long period of time to make a lot of chips. Up on the ceiling, I left this port. Here's what I'll have up there long term. You've seen this piece plenty of times. This is going to sit on the end of that fitting. This is a new piece. It's just a plain end cap. I made this material very thin, and I put these webs in to make it stiffer. I also put this hole in here, and this hole in here. Let me show you what those do. Through the magic of 3D printing, that string is going through a cavity that goes all the way around the edge and pops out here. I totally could have put a little loop on here, but I felt like doing something silly. Now if I want to use the planer, I'll take this cap off and install a hose. And if I want to sweep the floor or clean off a tool, I'll plug a long hose in here and take it where I need it. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that the output air from the dust collector was venting right into the room. Back then, I may have misspoken about how good a job it was doing separating all of the particles. Let me demonstrate. I have this box of sawdust. I have this hose attached to the bandsaw's dust chute, which I glossed over and did not explain very well in the video. I am going to aggressively vacuum up this dust while the camera is watching the output of the dust collector. I think you folks will be able to see why I'm... I think you folks will be able to tell why I'm disappointed with the filtering. <laughs> I'm starting to understand why my pool table always seems to have a fine layer of dust on it. My solution is this box I've built around the outside of the dust collector. It has slots inside that are designed to take these common furnace filters. These are just the cheapest filters that money can buy, but I built them in a common size, so if I want to upgrade to better filters later, I can always get those. So let's put these in and see what kind of a difference we get. And also, I'm going to take this as a personal challenge. Alrighty then, let's do the same test as before, trying to keep everything about the same, uh, except for the camera angle, obviously. Can only get so close with that. Let's go! These filters have a very large particle size that can go through them. If I need a higher level of filtration in the future, I can always go get better ones that are the same size that'll fit. In the meantime, I've got very little resistance to airflow, I can test out how the system works as a whole, and I can find the balance between filtration and airflow. I think that covers all the most interesting parts of the system. 
As time goes on, I'll be making improvements and changes, but those will need to be shown in a follow-up video. All of the 3D printed parts you've seen are my original designs, and if you'd like to print them yourself, just get in touch with me somehow and, uh, you, you know, you know that, that, all that stuff. So, I hope you learned something, and if you didn't learn something, I hope you were at least entertained. And if you weren't entertained, I hope you uh, didn't have something better to do.